Hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. This is a lot of fun. I wish I could be there in person. I do apologize for that. Some passport problems, but I hope to in two years uh, join you uh, in person uh, at this next conference. So let's get started. Disruptive change, embracing ambiguous innovation. And I've chose this title because change can be disruptive. Change can also be beautiful. But one thing that change always is, it's, it's unknown. We have an idea of where we're going, but we're not actually quite sure of where that's going to take us, right? So we know we know what our goal is, but the journey is different. And if we try to duplicate that journey and that success from any other library, any other organization, uh, it doesn't quite work out the same way, right? So there's always the unknowns when uh, you're on this disruptive change journey. And so let's go ahead and dig in. Uh, first, we need to define what I'm talking about when I say disruptive change, because there's a lot of different models out there, right? So this is what I'm talking about. When we talk about to disrupt, what I'm using as a definition is to interrupt the status quo, okay? To interrupt the status quo, to interrupt normal. So normal no longer exists. Whatever normal was, when we disrupted, it will not be that again, okay? And so when we say change, we're talking about to make radically different. So again, if it's going to disrupt it and it's gonna make it radically different, then we will actually have true change. We cannot say we've changed and look the exact same, okay? So here's our working definition for this presentation. Disruptive change is the inter interruption of the status quo through radical change of your environment. And your environment can be anything. It can be your library. It can be your institution, right? It can be your community. Uh, whatever that environment is, the point of this is that the change that's going to take place will be disruptive enough to reset the status quo. So when I'm talking about change, all right, I'm going social, um, uh, the social change model here. Change happens in three orders. There's first, first order change, which is structure and process, okay? Uh, structure is, is, is how we're organized, the process of how we do things and the procedures that we set, right? Uh, that's first order change. Second order change is culture, right? So when we're talking about culture, we're, we're talking about beliefs and customs and social behaviors. And, and I want to pause here and, and say this note, in order for there to be true change within an organization, there must always be first order and second order change. If you have one or the other, you do not have full change. If you just change structure and process, but culture's bad, it will destroy your structure and your process. If you change culture, but have bad structure and process, you'll burn out your people, right? That's that's the way it works. That's where most of us work in. That's our, that's our world. Now, if you have first and second order change set, then third order change will begin to work on its own. And that is the empowerment within the people within your organization to make change on their own, right? That's the goal to get to. So why is this important, all right? Why are we even talking about organizational development at library conference? Um, and we're supposed to be talking about innovation and everything. Well, this is why. Because just recently and continually in different ways, uh, we have a world health crisis. And here in the United States, our world health crisis uh, with COVID challenged us and it challenged many of us around the world and it challenged us to do things differently. And so we had to shift quickly. It opened our eyes to new innovations, all right? And it uncovered new challenges. And so some of the new challenges that were uncovered within our organization, in our library, as well as at our institution as a whole here at Catawba College, we're a private four-year uh, liberal arts institution, we discovered, which was always in front of us, but we just missed it, um, how large the digital divide is within our student body and within our employee uh, population as well. Digital divide was huge and still is, but we're making progress. 
We also began to understand more of the diversity, equity, and inclusion challenges that we had among our students and among our all of our employees, our faculty, and our staff. And then also we learned that we had a lack of organizational development, full organizational development. We depended on a handful of individuals to do many different things, whether it was technology-wise or procedure-wise or whatever. Uh, we, we depended on those individuals. And when crisis hit and it was mo too much work for just five or six or 10 individuals to handle, we realized we had a lack of organizational development. This is true in libraries as well. We still, while we develop and while we learn and while we shift, here in America, what we're finding is for our, our technological needs as we're moving forward in offering the services that we need to provide um, to make progress on some of these social issues, we're finding that the library profession is not equipping librarians with these skills as they're graduating from uh, university with their library degrees. And so we are now hiring outside of the profession Right, because we have this lack of organizational, the true organizational development for the 21st century and beyond. So with all of this, we realized we needed to change. OK, but when you're changing, you're also taking a chance because why? Because the road is unknown. Uh, you're, you're embarking on something that's different, something. At your organization, something that is putting you in a place where you might not know where you're going, but that's okay. So we're doing something different. So when we decided to be different, we decided to focus, refocus on who we are. And these are the things that came up that mattered. People, innovation, quality, and what we call the web, which is well-being, equity, and belonging. So let's dig into these. So when we looked at this, and this looks, should look really familiar to you, <laughs> when we decided to dig into each one of these, this, the, the, the people, the innovation, the quality, and the well-being, equity, and belonging, uh, I was reminded of the work that I was privileged to do with OCLC in 2020 and 2021 on the UN SDGs. And so with the SDG project that we did, the survey that was done for libraries all around the world, we got valuable data. And what we found in the Americas was this. 20% of all countries that were surveyed in the Americas, only 20% of the libraries within those countries who responded to the survey said that they even considered the SDGs in their planning for the future. That's it. They just considered it. Nothing more. Only 2% actually referenced that they were doing anything. And so I remembered this data as we were embarking on this journey for change. And, and it was in, in working with my library, we decided we wanted to use the SDGs to refocus us in the things that we value and also in how we introduce new innovation to our campus and to make progress on large socioeconomic uh, disparities with the digital divide, but also make progress in areas of well-being, equity, and belonging, and in our quality of education. So this is what we did. So let's talk about each one of these. I think I have about 10 minutes left with you. So let's talk about each one of these and how they connect. Okay. So people which can be the way we do it here with people, we're, we're connecting it directly to SG, uh, SDG 8, number 8. And um, it can connect to many of the other SDGs, but in this specific sense, what we really wanted to, to get to at the heart was try to solve some of those challenges that we uncovered. So when we're talking about people, we want people to have the decent work and economic growth. So it's not just about upskilling someone for their job to be better here at Catawba College or here in the Courier Lynn Black Library. It's upskilling them for life. It's giving them what they need where if they ever depart from this institution that they can excel in life because they have a new skill. So not just the skill, but everything behind the skill that allows them to interact and be culturally adept and move within society. 
right? So it's a big undertaking. It's something that we don't necessarily always think of in our organizations as we're working with our students. Uh, we think of it, but and then when we start working with our staff and we start working with our faculty, it's not so much the focus as what they bring to the table. Now we're saying, we know what you bring, but we're investing in you. And we want to know where your, we want to match your personal passion with uh, the position that best fits you within the organization. And then once we map that, we know that you'll start living out purpose, right? So this, this is the focus. So one way we knew we could do this is to make sure that we could educate our um, people in a way where we could remove barriers to their learning. So the first thing we decided to do is embark on open access, right? Um, and really be do it with a in, in a more intentional way than just making it available, but making it part of uh, individual growth, personal fulfillment, and um, personal fulfillment, and I would say uh, care for the people who are within our care, our students, our faculty, and our staff. It's giving people, giving people um, not just access, but uh, tutors along the way to help those who needed it, interpreting uh, the information that they're finding, but then also creating a badging system where whatever it is people are learning in this in this market where we're hosting uh, these these trainings and, and everything that we're bringing in for everyone to see, which only costs us to host. We're bringing in all this information from around the world and they can learn. Then we badge them and we make sure that the badge works for them when they leave. We make sure that they can use it um, within their digital resumes or whatever, so that they can get uh, a credit for what they're doing and the credential can follow them and, and we invest into them as well. So innovation, um, SDG number nine, right? Everybody wants to be innovative. And, and I will challenge you, innovation is not just technology. Innovation, you can be innovative in doing a practice or procedure differently that is an innovative way of doing it that's different. It does not have to be technology. But in this case, we're talking about tech, right? So what you see before you is what's called a, a farm bot. This is a um, solution in farming that helps individuals who do not know how to grow food to be able to use this robot uh, to be able to grow food. Um, I don't want to say for them because you still have to learn to, <laughs> to work the software. However, the software is open source. We have made the conscious decision to move away from anything that is proprietary in nature when it comes to uh, giving people skills for life. When you remove the proprietary in nature software and, 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 and devices, then you start moving to a place where people can actually live and learn and work and grow with this technology outside of your organization and they can bring it back to their communities for change and you begin to start lower lowering and removing barriers um, that have been in place that stop us from growing in our communities because of cost and so this open source software uh, helps you uh, run this robot and uh, we, we teach <laughs> we teach you how to do that. We're still learning ourselves. And uh, it's solar powered. It's solar powered. It allows uh, you to uh, do your farming um, in a fashion that's sustainable and in a fashion that removes, again, more barriers uh, to success in, in lower socioeconomic communities. That being said, all parts of this innovation are this techno technological innovation are uh, three, most of them are 3D printed. And so we have the 3D um, printing facilities here to allow you to be able to learn how to create, fix these parts so that you're not held um, captive by any organization or any institution on your equipment and, and trying to make sure that it, it's uh, working for, for your needs. And so that moves us to quality. And so we wanted to focus in quality education. This is one of our, our students and and in this video, he's learning how to 3D print and he's learning how to scale and, and we're upskilling him for life as well. And that goes for anyone. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter where you come from. 
Uh, these skills are available to all students, but not just available. We are now working within what we call the Catawba Core to intentionally design these things that work for students. So every student, regardless of major who comes onto our campus, will be able to come into this library and will be able to learn these skills for life that, it, that they can take back to their communities to make change. But in that same vein, these are not just available, but also there for all of our employees who are learning a new skill for life so that they can go back and create change in their employees. So quality is important to us in not just what we deliver, but also providing equity in education. And I would challenge you and say, when you achieve equity, you are finally moving uh, toward quality. So that brings us to uh, the web. It's what we call the web which is well-being, equity, and belonging, which is going to be SDG 10, so reduced inequalities. And this is our through line in all that we do. There are two through lines in everything that we do now. One is sustainability. The other is well-being, equity, and belonging. Every decision that's made, any new uh, technology that we procure, any new initiative that we start, we begin with sustainability, well-being, equity, and belonging. If it does not hit our rubric, then we do not do it. This prepares us for the future. This deliberately develops our organization so that we can be successful in any crisis now that arises. We will be able to pivot differently. We will be able to not just have to upskill, but change at the right time. Um, be able to educate our communities so that they can create change when they're not connected to this anymore. We would love for them to stay connected, but the reality is we know some people who come in our library, some people who come uh, within our institution here at Catawba College may not come back once their journey in life may take them somewhere else, but they should always have the things that we have instilled within them to be able to go out and create change. And the biggest thing in that is design thinking and how to think about problems and social issues and remove themselves from uh, the dependency on the uh, technology and move more into the vein of innovation in the thinking of the mind. So we, we end with the beginning, okay? Big change is also a big chance because chance, because there's a chance for success, but there's also a chance for failure. Leadership is always risky, um, but if done and done well, there is opportunity that is there for all of us and we can seize the day and make sure that the opportunity does not pass us by, but that we move into the vein of success with it. So while it is risky, while there is ambiguity there, uh, there's also success there if we can get down the road. So again, let's talk about our definition. When we say disruptive change, we say the interruption of the status quo through radical change of your environment. So I'll give you this because it's been a great conference. Everybody is charged. Everybody has something that they're taking back with them, more than one thing, more than likely. Um, and so I want to give you a, a, a lease on life, so to speak, an empowerment tool for you to work with. So here we go. Be disruptive, be radical, and create change. Thank you. very much uh, prof for that address you really are giving us a lot uh, to take away from this conference um i just want to hi highlight um just a few things that you've mentioned to us um that normal no longer exists i think that it really is the conversations we've had previously and this just confirms that going forward, we really need to, to be charting uh, new paths for ourselves as individuals, but also in our libraries. Uh, we really appreciate how you've made it clear how the journey for change within your institution links directly to those four um, SDG areas. 
uh, you are giving us something practical to consider in our planning and also in how we engage um, with our students and with our campuses. And I think the key thing also is around lifelong learning. So it's not just the journey of, of our students while they are here on campuses, but it's also things that um, are going to, to last them uh, through the life journey. So we really appreciate that. Colleagues, please can we just give Prof another round of applause. Thank you. We know it's very early um, in North Carolina, so we really appreciate you joining us at such an early hour. So if you can just afford us a few questions, please. Uh, colleagues, so we can take a few questions. So there's one that's... I think there's a question that's online. How did you navigate or manage the grades, I'm sorry, my eyesight is not that great. Resignation. Oh, the great resignation in your library. I hope you can see that, Prof. I, I can. That's a great question. Um, so there, you are correct. Uh, there is a great resignation that has happened uh, in the entire library profession. And so what we decided to do um, to navigate that, and it, it wasn't easy. I found myself uh, in the role that I, I'm in at Kataba, I found myself um, having to do more work in the library than I've done in years uh, on, a, on a granular level because of it. But it also gave us opportunity, okay? So as we started thinking about what we needed to become moving forward, when we had the great resignation, we said, okay, traditionally, we would fill these positions with traditional library positions. But now, maybe we have an opportunity to see that there's something that we want to do that's going to take us five to 10 years down the road that we're not doing now. While we still have traditional duties that need to happen, how can we create this everyone culture? There's, there's a book called Everyone Culture, and it really helps... Uh, you on this. And that's, I read that book and that really helped me. Um, and everyone culture. And so how do we create this everyone culture? So um, th the work that is needed is not just lying within the lap of professionals, but even those who are not our uh, professional librarians, how do we upskill them to be able to do this cross-functional work in a different way? So during this great resignation, work still gets done, but we're also preparing for our future. And so that's what we started to navigate and ask those questions and, and uh, pull away duties and change titles and create new positions and start looking outside the profession um, and, and making change that way. Colleagues, are there any other questions? So while colleagues are still considering, I wanted just to extend and maybe ask uh, on the point of, of belonging, because I think in South Africa, we also have these conversations uh, where students uh, find that the environment, well, it's not limited to students, even staff, in terms of our transformation journey, people find that campuses are an alienating space so maybe if you can give us just a pointer or two on how do you create the sense of belonging? Thank you. Yes, so um, when it comes to belonging, and, and I'm gonna be very transparent with you. One of, I'll give you this example. One of my librarians um, who's been here 20 years, great librarian, had to go in for a surgery and we were informed that that surgery would leave her deaf when she came back to the library. So she met with me and she asked me, um, I, I really love my job here at the library. Is there still a place for me? And it made me take a step back for a minute because for someone to ask me, is there a place for me? What have you observed that makes it feel like that you don't fit in if this change happens? So it made us realize that we were not as um, accommodate, not accommodating, but our culture was not as such where everyone belonged. 
Okay. And so we start reexamining everything to our furniture, to our lighting, to how we connect to one another in the speech and things that we talk to our, to our policies, our procedures, everything is considered now. Okay. So to create more of a, a campus where people belong. And we first did this in our library. And then uh, in, in my work with the president, we started doing this across campus. And so one small example for belonging during uh, the height of COVID, we, we did a lot of hand sanitizer machines. And the, and the building, remember I'm a tech guy, the building blocks of code for hand sanitizing is sensory code. And sensory code comes from the 1950s, it's old code. The original people who wrote that code were of Caucasian complexion and descent. And so that, cause that was the time in the 1950s. So the code when tested works on people who have lighter complexion of skin. So the sensory machines work well in light, but if they're in an area that is not lit well and you have a darker complexion of skin, you cannot use the dispensing machines, right? <laughs> Just to clean your hands. And so now it's starting to actually look at algorithms of oppression, right, for belonging uh, and, uh, and looking at how we do our technology as well to make sure it works for everyone. And so those are some examples that we've done. Scanners in the library, um, we're in the process of purchasing, it, purchasing a scanner where you, if you scan something, you get to choose what format you want it in, whether it's ebook, audiobook, or braille, to make sure it works for everyone. Thank you very much, Prof. Colleagues, are there any questions? Okay, I don't see any other hands in the room. I think there's one question online. How do you conscientize or embed the SDGs and triple bottom line into the strategy and make it consistent reminder to staff? I think that will be our final question. That's a good question. Um, so at the time when I was actually doing the study with OCLC, I was on the global council. So we helped plan the study and, uh, and all of that. And it was fun being behind the scenes and I was really excited. And I realized that my excitement did not get other people excited in my library. So my excitement didn't matter, right? Um, so the way we made progress on the SDGs was we made it a part of the culture. And when you make it a part of the culture, part of the belief systems, part of the values, part of the core of who you are, it's just the culture, right? Then the structure and procedures and how you organize your organization or, or titles within your organization, however you want to do it, um, when they match that, then you can actually truly implement and make progress on those SDGs. And you don't have to constantly remind your staff, it just becomes part of who they are. And then here's the secret of it, okay? Because even when you do all that, there's still no buy-in. Always remember this, people support what they co-create. If they do not, if they're not allowed to co-create, they will not support it. So if you're making this change, allow your, your, your people uh, who are in your care to co-create with you what this process looks like for that change, right? And so one one tool that you can use to do that, um, I will show it to you, but we're not we don't have time. If I was there, I'd I'd write it on a board for you. It's called um, the Three Horizon um, Theory. Look up the Three Horizon Theory by Bill Sharp, and it'll teach you how to connect to your people in your first horizon, second horizon, and third horizon, so that they can have the opportunity to co-create along with you. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. I think you've given us a lot to consider.